City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene's update on COVID-19 for New York City healthcare providers. Today we're bringing you <laughs> sorry. Today we're bringing you topics from three speakers here at the health department: Dr. Mary Foote, Dr. Julia Schillinger, and Dr. Deborah Kaplan. As a reminder, please note that you've been placed in listen-only mode. If you have any questions during the presentation, please submit them via the Q&A portion of the WebEx, and we will address them as time allows. A PDF of these slides, as well as a recording of today's webinar, will be available on our webpage following today's presentation. We appreciate you taking your time to join us this afternoon. Here's Dr. Foote. Hi, thank you so much, Allison, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. So. Uh, we're going to start out with just a snapshot of where are we now if you're in New York City and globally, give you some, some of the latest updates on New York City surveillance uh, and clinical updates, and then uh, my colleague Dr. Schillinger is going to give you an update on multisystem inflammatory syndrome in children, Miss C in other words. And then Dr. Kaplan will be covering underlying structural inequalities and the impact of COVID-19 on pregnancy and sexual reproductive health in New York City. And hopefully we'll, we'll uh, have some time remaining for questions and discussion. So just uh, taking a look at where are we now, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, as you are all probably well aware, uh, continues worldwide. Suppression has been achieved in some areas, but unfortunately, the outbreak is still accelerating in others. Um, and in particular, we have been seeing a significant uptick in transmission in cases uh, in the southern hemispheres, which, uh, of course, obviously is very concerning, uh, along with a, a few remaining hotspots in Europe and other parts of the world. Uh, and we are also seeing some countries that have started to uh, lighten their stay-at-home orders and social distancing measures that are now seeing um, some resurgence in cases as well. So these are all uh, events that we're watching very closely. Since the first confirmed case of COVID-19 in New York City, over 2,100 deaths have been attributed to the disease. And following our peak here in New York City that occurred in early to mid-April, our daily case counts, hospitalizations, and deaths have fortunately been steadily declining. So this suggests that mitigation measures that we have taken, including physical distancing, are working, which is great. But that means these measures must be maintained as we are preparing to transition to suppression measures. We can't, uh, we are not in a place where we can let up just yet. So this is a map from the Johns Hopkins University COVID-19 dashboard showing uh, worldwide global case counts. So globally, we are looking at now over 500 million cases and over 300,000 deaths worldwide from COVID-19. And this is a map from the New York Times, which shows cumulative cases and deaths in the USA. And as you can see, of course, the New York City um, and Northeast Corridor has certainly been and remains the real hotspot in the country, but there have been others um, you know, that have had activities ramping up, uh, especially more uh, in the Midwestern, uh, the Midwestern states and the South. So we have had over 1.5 million cases uh, in the US which accounts for about 30% of confirmed global cases. And we have had now over 94,000 deaths, which is again, about 30% of, of reported global deaths. And our current status of the outbreak in New York City, this is, these are data as of the 21st. So we have now uh, registered 100, over 192,000 laboratory confirmed cases. We have experienced, uh, seen over 50,000 hospitalizations for COVID-19 and about 21,000 deaths, including 16,000 confirmed and almost 5,000 probable. And probable deaths um, largely come from uh, data after death uh, and death certificate uh, listing COVID as a cause of death. And this is looking at just a snapshot of the course of the epidemic here in New York City from the start uh, of when we started identifying cases back in the beginning of March through May 21st. So the first graph shows the number of cases 
uh, that have been laboratory confirmed cases. And as you can see, we have a very nice trend going down and there's uh, a bit of a lag on the data, which is why it's listed through 517. And hospitalizations is the second graph that we're looking at in New York City. And the last uh, graph that we see is deaths by date of, so deaths by date of death. And it just, uh, we do expect to see a lag of about a one to two weeks after uh, hospitalizations um, and between hospitalization date and death. So this is looking at COVID-19 rates by borough in New York City. And that's by rate uh, of number of positive cases per 100,000 people in each borough. So you can see that Bronx has really uh, been the hotspot in terms of activity uh, by case rate, uh, along with Staten Island and Queens. And just of note, cumulative case count, Queens has had the highest number of cases overall. And these are just looking at some of the New York City specific milestones that we have um, developed that are, are specific to us in our community. So the first milestone of success that we're looking for are the number of people admitted to New York City hospitals for COVID-19 like illness. And so you can see the dotted line is uh, 200. Um, and this is a daily rate. And so 200 is double the average for prior years in the city at a comparable uh, point in time. And so as you can see, we've actually been below that line for uh, over 10 consecutive days, which is where uh, we would like to be. And this milestone is looking at people in critical care units across, and this is data specific to the New York City Health and Hospital System, so New York City Health and Hospitals facilities. Um, and we have seen you know, a steady decline of numbers of people in the ICUs. However, uh, we are still not quite where we want to be. Um, in terms of uh, meeting our milestone goals, which is less than 375 daily. And so one thing that I'm really excited to introduce everybody to is we have uh, a fantastic new resource uh, available on the New York City Department of Health uh, website, which is our new and improved data page. This has been a a phased rollout um, of data, public accessibility for our data. And we are really excited that now it is a much richer, much more interactive uh, site that gives you, um, you know, researchers and others access to our data to do their own analyses as well uh, as really gets at a lot more of the um, kind of community level data uh, that uh, I think is of interest to uh, many people in our uh, New York City community. So the major features are include an interactive map of rates, counts of cases, deaths, and positive tests by zip code, tests conducted daily, and percent of people with positive test results, and much more detailed information on cases, hospitalization, and deaths by borough of residence, age, sex, race, race, ethnicity, and neighborhood poverty level. Public and providers can now search to find information specific to their neighborhood and demographic profile. And there's a nice visualization display of disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on communities of color and low-income communities. Um, and as you know, unfortunately, Black and Latino New Yorkers have been uh, experiencing death around twice the rate of their white counterparts when adjusted for age in New York City during this pandemic. And so this is just a screenshot of the main page. At the top, you'll see various tabs that can bring you to specific uh, types of data that you might be looking for. And this is one of our um, nice shaded maps that is looking at data by zip code of residents. And you can uh, kind of hover over your area of interest and that has detailed data for that zip code, including neighborhood name, case count rate, um, and deaths and deaths rates. And so if you click on the deaths page, um, this is what you'll see. And you can find detailed summaries of the death data, including cases by age, sex, and race, and ethnicity. And also by age and underlying conditions. So we really encourage you to visit this new site and um, take a look at all it has to offer. We're very, very proud and excited about this. Um, it offers a really nice visual display of the data showing, showing that 
Again, there's a disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on communities of color. This will allow public and providers both to search data specific to their neighborhood and demographic profile and make informed decisions. And we just want to really emphasize that these data are being used by the city to target our efforts to areas and populations that are most highly impacted um, to really uh, you know, create an equitable response and recovery uh, efforts. And also just wanted to point out that our maps also include information on testing, supplies, telehealth, food access, education, outreach, uh, outline our outreach efforts and uh, other support services. So here are screenshots, also the New York City pages and a link to the site looking at um, our response map and all the resources that I just mentioned. So with that, we are finished with our New York City specific updates and I'm going to turn it over to my esteemed colleague, Julia Schillinger to uh, give you updates on multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children. Thank you. Schillinger, are you on mute? <laughs> I'm so sorry, I was. Um, so I will be speaking about multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children. And just to be clear, this was previously referred to as pediatric multi-system inflammatory syndrome or PMIS, but it is one and the same. It's now being referred to by this name. Next slide, please. So this is a syndrome that is temporarily uh, associated with COVID-19 infection. We're still uh, learning about what the exact cause is, but it is a serious illness that has some of the overlapping features of clinical, um, clinical features of Kawasaki disease and toxic shock syndrome. It uh, is typically characterized by fever, sometimes high, lasting several days along with other symptoms that include abdominal pain, diarrhea, vomiting, conjunctivitis, rash, irritability or sluggishness, and lymph adenopathy. I do want to caution that we're still learning about, first of all, the spectrum of disease, the severity levels, as well as the breadth of symptoms that may be involved. But the general thinking now is that rather than this being an acute infection, this this um, illness is, is triggered by uh, COVID-2 um, because we're seeing that most of the children that have had serologies have a positive antibody for SARS-CoV-2, um, while fewer have virus detected. And that and the fact that some of them have had COVID-like illness in the past weeks before suggests that this illness may be mediated by an immune response rather than by direct viral injury. Next slide, please. So in terms of what the health department is doing, we are investigating all reports that come in from providers and applying a standard set of criteria to determine whether or not they are cases. I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, we are doing provider education and outreach regarding identification of, of this illness in children and putting together the data to describe the local epidemiology. We are interacting with both PICUs and hospitals and providers at all levels um, to learn as much as we can about this. And we have a fact sheet that is aimed at parents and caregivers. Um, letters have gone out from the DOE to parents and also letters have gone out to the REC child care centers, which are the child care centers that were kept open for the children of essential workers. Um, a media campaign is in development and we are coordinating regularly with CDC. Next slide, please. Next slide. So 
So I mentioned that we are investigating um, all reports and determining whether they're cases. And the way we do that is we're, we're following a set of criteria that New York State outlined. Um, could you go back uh, about three slides, I think? Uh, yeah, please go back. Perfect, thank you. Um, we are aligning our reporting requirements with those of New York State. And um, the New York State requirements, which are on the next slide, um, are for um, reporting should come for any individual younger than 21 who meets, who is hospitalized, uh, and meets a variety of criteria. There are clinical criteria, which are uh, at least one day of subjective or measured fever, hospitalization, as I mentioned, and either one or more of the following set of, of um, measures of severity, hypotension or shock, features of severe cardiac illness, or other severe end organ involvement, or two or more of the following clinical findings, macular papular rash, bilateral non purulent conjunctivitis, mucocutaneous inflammatory signs, and acute GI symptoms. Severe uh, abdominal pain has been seen in uh, many of these children. Uh, so these are the clinical criteria. They also need to meet a set of laboratory criteria on the next slide. These laboratory criteria are two or more of the following. Uh, there you can see, I won't read them all, but the first three are uh, hematologic indices that uh, may be disrupted. And then um, the majority of the remaining laboratory criteria are for um, inflammatory markers. Um, and the only other thing that, that is needed to meet the case definition is to not have a really viable alternative diagnosis. Next slide, please. So as these reports come in to us, we initiate an investigation and we do a medical record review, a detailed medical record review. And then we actually apply the reports were based on the New York State reporting criteria, but to count somebody as a case of MISC, we are applying a CDC MISC case definition. Uh, the great advantage of that is that that is going to be used across the country in different states and cities, and so it allow us to track things in a common, in a common manner. Um, as of May 21st, we had had 180 reports, and of those, 120 have been reviewed, uh, and 90 were found to meet the CDC criteria for a case of MISC. The balance, the 30, uh, there were 30 that did not meet criteria, and then there are 60 um, potential cases that are still under investigation. There has been one death reported in a New York City uh, child to date. Next slide, please. These are data, um, again, uh, as of yesterday. Uh, there were 90 cases, and of those, um, the largest number were in the age group five to nine. That accounted for 40% of the 90 cases. There was a slight male preponderance at 54%. Next slide, please. The geographic distribution in terms of borough residents, um, the largest proportion came from the Bronx, 34%. And in terms of race ethnicity distribution, the largest proportion uh, came from black African American uh, children, followed by Hispanic Latino. Next slide, please. So we are um, asking providers to immediately, if you see a, a suspected case, um, me immediately refer that child to a specialist in either pediatric infectious disease, rheumatology, or if, if very severe, uh, critical care. And, and referrals should be uh, very rapid. Um, because some of these children are progressed rapidly uh, to uh, hypotension. Uh, providers should conduct molecular and serologic testing uh, for SARS-CoV-2 on all suspected cases. And um, it's critical, as I mentioned, that there be early diagnosis and treatment of patients who are um, either 
ill or worsening, and those who meet full or partial criteria for Kawasaki disease. Um, because it's critical to prevent end, or, end organ damage and other long-term complications. And those patients um, who do meet full criteria for Kawasaki disease should be treated with intravenous immunoglobulin and aspirin. Next slide, please. So, yeah, we are calling on the provider community to please call the provider access line at 866-692-3641 to report any patient who you think meets criteria for MISC. And um, you should report all suspected cases regardless of laboratory evidence of SARS-CoV-2 infection. You may uh, recall that that is not um, a requirement for reporting. Um, and SARS-CoV-2 infection and MISC should be considered in any pediatric death where there's any evidence um, of infection. And reporting to New York City, this is just a reminder that, that reporting to New York City is required by the New York State Sanitary Code and by the New York City Health Code. And it's in addition to reporting required to New York State via the HERD system, uh, which is a system that applies to hospitals for reporting. So, um, it may, you know, it may be duplicate, but, but uh, local as well as state health authorities need to hear about each of these cases. Thank you very much. And just these are some references. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Schillinger. Uh, now we'll pass it over to Dr. Kaplan to discuss structural inequities and the impact of COVID-19 on pregnancy and sex sexual and reproductive health in NYC. Great, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Um, great, thank you. Next slide, please. From 2011 to 2015, there were a total of 273 pregnancy-associated deaths, which are deaths occurring from any cause during pregnancy or within one year from the end of pregnancy in New York City. And of these, 115 or 42% were pregnancy-related, meaning they were caused by pregnancy or its management. 156 or 57% were not pregnancy-related, and two deaths, there were, uh, we could not determine the relationship. Well, that means that every year about 25 women die of a pregnancy-related cause, and we know that at least half of these deaths, based on review, were preventable. Uh, in, compared with the previous five-year period, there was an overall increase in pregnancy-associated deaths, but the number and proportion of deaths that were causally related to pregnancy was lower. Deaths that were not pregnancy related, however, did increase largely due to deaths due to substance use and cancer. The increase in substance use related deaths corresponds to the national opioid crisis, but the increase in cancer deaths was likely due to improved ascertain ascertainment of pregnancy associated deaths. And this report is available on the DOH website. Next slide, please. This is a slide on the black-white disparity in pregnancy-related deaths over a 15-year period. And we used a three-year rolling average of these pregnancy-related mortality ratios for, black, for both black Latinx, I will refer to as black and white Latinx, referred to as white women. And uh, we can see that the black ratio ranges from six to more than 12 times that of the white ratio since 2001, with an average, on average, black women were 8.4 times more likely to die of a pregnancy-related cause than white women. Next slide, please. In addition, we see racial and ethnic inequities in severe maternal morbidity or life-threatening complications of pregnancy. In 2006, more than 2,800 women experienced severe maternal morbidity, also called SMM, related to birth. And what that means is that for every woman who dies from a pregnancy-related cause in New York City, over 100 women also die. And if you look at the red, two bars with red circles, 
black women had three times higher rates than white women of severe maternal morbidity and all other racial ethnic groups had higher SMM rates compared with white women. Next slide, please. In addition, and particularly striking and shocking, is that black women with a college degree uh, had higher rates of severe maternal morbidity than women of all other races and ethnicities without even a high school degree. We know that generally higher education is protective and we see that for black women in particular, this is not the case. Next slide, please. So what is driving the inequity in maternal morbidity and mortality? Racism and gender oppression are conspiring to create these inequities. And as you can see on the slide, the, some of the ways that these structural factors are manifested, and this is not unique to maternal morbidity and mortality, though we are focusing on that today and this part of the presentation, are poor housing, poor access to resources, and disrespectful care. Structural racism is related to historical injustice that has driven intentional disinvestment in neighborhoods where predominantly Black and Latinx people live, resulting in unequal access to resources and services that are essential for ensuring good health. This and the effects of racism on the body lead to chronic stress and chronic illness, which have been shown to negatively impact birth outcomes and result in disparities. And with no, and, and structural racism is a, the key reason that COVID-19 is disproportionately affecting people of color, who, who, which you heard earlier in the presentation, including, of course, people who are pregnant and giving birth, uh, which further impacts and exacerbates the impact of structural racism on birth outcomes. Next slide, please. These are some of the examples that have been reported to us and we've heard through our own experience with home visits in the community. Families receiving WIC are having difficulty finding infant formula and other essential supplies. There are shortages such as diapers and, diap and cribs, limited uh, access to postpartum services, in particular support services like doulas and lactation support, uh, even though telehealth is now available, many people do not have access to it. And the heightened stress during this uh, pandemic exacerbates the existing stress that already places an increased risk on poor birth outcomes as we've seen for black and brown women in particular. Next slide, please. There is research, fairly recent research, that shows the impact of heightened periods of stress and crisis and public health crises and political crises on pregnancy outcomes. The New York City Health Department and the Harvard Chan School of Public Health published two years ago, severe socio-political stressors and preterm births in New York City. And they found an increased rates of preterm birth among Latino women associated with the 200, 2016 presidential election concluding that severe stressors, including economic and social threats and interpersonal violence, can lead to preterm births. There were similar findings post 9-11, and uh, so that evidence showing that stress, such as what people are experiencing now during this pandemic, are likely to impact birth outcomes, layered again upon the stress of structural racism. Next slide, please. So what is the health department doing about this? One piece of our response has been to start and launch a COVID-19 perinatal task force to support the public health and clinical response to COVID-19's impact on pregnant and postpartum people and their families. We have a three-pronged approach to promote the best possible birthing experience and birth outcomes for people giving birth during the pandemic to protect and mitigate the risk of COVID-19 for people giving birth, their newborns, their families, and the providers who serve them, and to preserve hospital personnel and beds for the COVID-19 response by reducing the use by people who do not require hospital care during prenatal care and during childbirth. Next slide, please. We've created a number of documents that are currently on the New York City Health Department's 
COVID-19 main page. We've included the links here. They include public facing guidance for people who are pregnant, breastfeeding or caring for newborns, infant feeding during the pandemic, and three documents for doulas who are often a key support in the community and including general recommendations, a guide to virtual support and helping prepare doula clients for unforeseen circumstances such as many are experiencing during the COVID-19 pandemic. Next slide, please. The Health Department and the Bureau of Maternal Infant Reproductive Health is guided in our work by applying a sexual and reproductive justice framework and lens to the work. And for those who are not familiar, sexual and reproductive justice exists when all people have the power and resources to make healthy decisions about their bodies, sexuality, and reproduction. This means that every person has the right to choose to have or not have a child, to choose the conditions under which to give birth or create a family, to care for their children with the necessary social support in a safe and healthy environment, and to control their own body and self-expression free from any form of sexual or reproductive oppression. And the team reproductive justice was coined by a group of black women in 1994. From this group, a framework and sister song, a collective led by indigenous women and women of color emerged. And we see that even during this pandemic, it is essential for us to uphold these principles. Next slide, please. One of the things that came from uh, the New York City Health Department's work with a sexual and reproductive justice community engagement group was a partnership that developed the New York City standards for respectful care at birth, which were distributed to all New York City maternity hospitals last year. This initiative was launched in 2018 and it promotes the human right to safe, respectful and quality maternity care including a community component where community members who've named themselves birth justice defenders and providers who are birth justice champions have joined together to educate people about their human right to respectful, safe, and quality care during their birthing experience. The brochures are available in seven different languages as well as posters and you can get them online or by calling 311. Next slide, please. In addition to maternal and uh, morbidity mortality and infant health, we are promoting and assuring that all providers are aware that sexual and reproductive health services have, are deemed essential services in all five boroughs as de determined and stated by the New York State Health Department. And it's very important to, to note this because there is a lot of confusion we are hearing from, from patients and community members who don't know if they can still access services during the pandemic. With that in mind, we, uh, the health department has developed a document, Sex During COVID-19, that is sex positive, that takes a harm reduction approach and focuses on safety and consent and particular instances that are necessary and includes a link to a sexual and reproductive health provider directory, which we have uh, revised and recently updated, which includes many uh, all services in all five boroughs that are available, including services for LGBTQ plus people, uh, men, women, range of, of, of options, adolescents, and uh, that can be accessed confidentially and safely. And uh, we hope that you will look for that and share that information. We want to provide sex positive messages while emphasizing safety and consent during the pandemic. And we know that COVID-19 exposes weaknesses we've seen as a city with respect to sexual health outcomes. Neighborhoods that have historically had high rates of STI, sexually transmitted infections, lower access to contraception and abortion are going to be disproportionately impacted by this pandemic. We ask that providers be vocal about alerting their patients to the, to the fact that sexual and reproductive health services are essential and are accessible in our city. Next slide, please. One of the ways we have been continuing to offer services during the pandemic is to continue our New York City Nurse Family Partnership. The Nurse Family Partnership is an evidence-based nurse home visiting program that has 
been in New York City since 2003 and proven over 40 years, for over 40 years to improve, improve the lives of low-income first-time parents. And our nurses support clients to have healthy pregnancies and babies, become knowledgeable and nurturing parents, reach education and employment goals, and provide their children with the best possible start in life. Our nurses serve people in every borough and every zip code, and nurses are conducting visits using telehealth during the COVID-19 emergency, and have, we are finding that they are often a lifeline for clients who are many times single parents and can be quite isolated and even more so than usual during the pandemic. Next slide, please. To refer people, the criteria are low-income first-time parent. They must enroll before 29 weeks gestation or about seven months, and they must live in New York City. In order to reach the most marginalized people in our city, three teams work specifically with teens in foster care, women and teens in homeless shelters, or who are involved with the criminal justice system. And it's easy to make a referral. Uh, calling 311 or sending a referral to the uh, email address listed uh, on, on the slide, nycnfp at health.nyc.gov. Next slide, please. Finally, I wanted to describe uh, major concerns our city has around intimate partner violence, which is the real or threatened aggression committed by a current or former partner. And intimate partner violence can be seen or experienced in multiple ways and in, through multiple forms. There's verbal abuse, which can include name calling, insulting or humiliating someone, coercive behaviors to threaten, monitor or control a person, physical violence, including hitting, slapping, shoving, choking, and other potentially physically harm ways to harm someone. During the COVID-19 pandemic, there has been ex intentional exposure of partners to the virus, obstruction of access to care, and control over child custody. We know that intimate partner violence occurs over different life stages and can develop lasting cumulative negative health impacts and in, in extreme cases, premature death results. It's a particular issue to continue to be very aware of and knowing the resources for on the next slide, please. First, to say that this, the intimate partner violence has a heavy toll on health, particularly for women of color who bear a disproportionate impact from intimate partner violence. COVID-19 already is challenging people, including grief, economic struggle, and mounting physical and mental health concerns. And these challenges are exacerbated for New Yorkers who are confined at home at times when the intimate partner violence already existed or where it, it is ignited by COVID-19. As I said, people who are oppressed or marginalized face elevated risk of IPV, including sexual minorities, immigrants, and women of color. Next slide, please. New York City intimate partner violence services and resources are included here, including information and resources for people experiencing dating, domestic, gender-based, or family violence, including elder abuse, through the website nyc.gov slash nychope or calling the 24-7 domestic violence hotline. The Mayor's Office to End Domestic and Gender-Based Violence normally operates family justice centers, but they are temporarily closed during the COVID-19 outbreak. However, they are available by phone. And to get more information, we've included the website. It, it is important to note that call volume is high and callers may have to a way to return call. But if you are referring someone to this service, please stress that someone, if they can't get through, someone will definitely call them back. And there are New York City resources for emotional support or mental health services for intimate partner violence or other needs for emotional or mental health support by calling New York City well, again, 24 hours a day, every day of the year, or texting well. Next slide, please. Thank you very much. That is the end of my presentation.
you to Dr. Kaplan as well as Dr. Schillinger and Dr. Foote for their presentations today. Uh, we do have time remaining for Q&A. As a reminder, please submit your questions via the Q&A section of the WebEx text box. And um, we, have a, we also have Dr. Didi Ray joining us to answer some of those questions as well as Dr. Foote, so you may see that in the chat box. So we have a question for Dr. Schillinger. Uh, can you review the difference between case definitions of MIS-C between New York City, New York State, and the CDC? On mute. Dr. Schillinger, are you on mute? Um, so we've had a couple questions come in about um, antibody testing and the implications of a positive antibody test and uh, whether or not any conclusions can be made in terms of its protective effect. Um, and uh, I think as of now, we still don't have sufficient evidence um, to make any real conclusions about um, what a positive antibody test means. Uh, especially because there are a lot of variables in terms of antibody titers, um, duration of immunity, uh, and um, there's just not enough information at this point to make any real prognostic um, decisions based off of uh, existing positive antibody tests. So, um, unfortunately, we still still can't make any uh, across the board recommendations about. Um, somebody with a positive positive antibody test confirmed serology uh, being able to not be reinfected within a certain period of time. And there is precedence um, of other seasonal coronaviruses um, of people being reinfected with the same uh, type of coronavirus within a year. So um, looking at other types of coronaviruses, we are very hesitant to make any uh, true conclusions at this point. Dr. Ray, do you have any questions? Uh, sure, sure. Um, so we have a question, uh, I think, for Dr. Kaplan. And these are, have pregnant women had a higher rate of prolonged infections or viral shedding with COVID-19? Uh, thank you. Can Thank you for that question. Just checking, I'm unmuted. Yes. Um, that is an excellent question, and we are in the process of reviewing data that helps us be able to look specifically at people pregnant and giving birth. We do not have that data available yet, but it is one of the research questions we are looking at to, to understand that. Um, and I don't have any further information at this point. I hope to at a further date. I don't know if any of my colleagues have any additional information on that. Uh, I think, yeah, I think that, um, you know, we'll have the, uh, we'll have those updates as we learn more about them. Um, we right. also have a, so we have a question for Dr. Schillinger now. Uh, and this is, so um, since Ms. C seems to be related to antibodies from COVID-19, uh, is this going to impact vaccine development? Sorry, Dr. Ray, it, it seems like Dr. Schillinger is uh, having an issue with her audio, but she maybe she can try to unmute herself in a moment and answer that question. <laughs> If not, we can come back to it if she figures that out. Sure. Um, maybe uh, Dr. Foote can address. Um, you know, we hear we're hearing a lot with the with the warm weather that COVID will just burn out in the summer, or you know, SARS one disappear. Do you have any opinions on that? Okay. So there is uh, certainly some 
conflicting data on that, but uh, as of now, we don't see any evidence that that is going to be the case, that warm weather will uh, cause any decrease in transmission. And I think we have really good examples right now um, from the Southern hemispheres um, and uh, especially the equatorial regions that have very tropical and hot climates that are still in India in particular. Uh, are experiencing very intense outbreaks right now. So I feel it, so we can't really make any conclusions right now. Um, and uh, yeah, and there is another subsequent question along the same notes. Do we think this will burn out similar to SARS? And at this point, again, we, we really don't have any evidence to suggest that is the case. SARS transmission was extremely different uh, than the way COVID-19 is transmitting. Um, the major challenge that we have now is that there is a very high viral load uh, in COVID-19 at the beginning of your uh, infection, uh, especially including during your asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic period. So it's more similar to the flu in that respect, which is why we're seeing um, so much more uh, transmission compared to some of the other coronaviruses, beta coronaviruses, such as MERS and SARS, which tend to have a much higher peak viral load much later in the infectious period and also have not demonstrated evidence of asymptomatic transmission. So that's that's really why we can't uh, make any kind of hopeful conclusions about uh, this just burning out. It is quite possible that this could just become a seasonal circulating virus, um, but there's a lot more to be uh, learned still. And uh, certainly uh, availability of a vaccine might certainly change the way uh, the future outlook will be. So that's all. Thanks, Dr. Foote. And uh, we have a couple questions for Dr. Kaplan here. Um, can you talk a little bit about the reasons why um, pregnancy morbidity is higher in African American women? And the the question in the chat box was talking about women who, for example, um, have a college education. Sure, absolutely. Uh, Yes. So basically, when, as, we, as we saw in that slide, pregnant uh, college education and education is normally protective and we're not seeing that. And that makes further clear the reason that we see racial inequities has to do with structural racism and the effects it has both his, had historically and that it continues to have and makes very all the more apparent that this is not about race it's about racism and there it, it's everything you know, this has been a historic issue where um, there have been intentional disinvestments in the communities where black and latinx people live because we do see inequities in that population as well compared to white people um, one example of that is redlining where na where banks purposely circled neighborhoods where, black, where majority black and brown people live to make decisions to not invest in those communities leading to neighborhoods with less access to healthy foods less access to, to good housing uh, at good education and all those factors. In addition, there is good evidence that the day-to-day -day impact of the day-to-day -day impact of racism on people's bodies, uh, the chronic stress actually can impact people's health and during uh, pregnancy can impact the ability to carry that pregnancy to term as well as increase the risk of comorbidities such as hypertension, diabetes, uh, heart disease, which will increase the risk of pregnancy complications, severe maternal morbidity and mortality, as they do increase the impact, as we've seen, of poor outcomes from COVID-19. And so now we're seeing a confluence of both these factors together. We, we see the, you know, a very major inequity uh, with black women's risk of dying from a preg pregnancy related cause. The most recent data, eight times more likely to die combined with the increased risk from COVID-19 and the root cause for both of these is structural racism as well as gender oppression. And the role of gender oppression in particular has an impact 
in one way through uh, or where both come together is around respectful care. I mentioned our document on respectful care at birth, and we looking at a range of factors that that happen, including implicit bias, where given our society, people don't even know, and we all as human beings have biases that we're not even aware of that impact how we treat different people and assumptions. And there are many studies on that in terms of treating pain differently by people's race, not by their symptoms. And so we have to look at the, at the kind of ways we educate people, the way we inform them of uh, procedures we will do, the way we treat them with respect and support them during childbirth. And all those are laid out in our New York City standards for respectful care. And our, our efforts at the New York City Health Department to address this have to do with both this work around respectful care as well as partnering with now 14 hospitals to improve uh, through the quality improvement process data review and implementing changes in policies and practices to impact these inequities. Hi, this is Julie Schillinger. I'm, I'm back on if uh, there's still time for questions. Yes. Um, okay, so Dr. Kaplan, I know we said we had a couple questions for you, but I think we're gonna go back to Dr. Schillinger really quickly. I'm giving you a really tough one. Uh, <laughs> And the tough one is if Miss C, if since Miss C res, seems to be related to antibodies from COVID-19, is this going to impact the vaccine or vaccine development? That it, no, that is a, a difficult but very important question. Um, and I'm not an expert in the field of vaccine development, but I I know that people are are talking about this issue, and um, is certainly a very very important consideration. Uh, to try to find, uh, develop a vaccine that doesn't have antigens that somehow provoke um, something like this. I think there was another question about the difference between the New York State and CDC case definitions or uh, yes. um, something yeah, to that. The three different sets right. of case definitions. If you could just go over that very quickly. Yeah, so I mean, first of all, the, the New York State, um, it's, it's not a case definition per se. It's a it's a call for please report these things to us. Um, and so and then when we get those reports, we apply the CDC case definition, and um, and we end up with a smaller group of of children. So I you know as you would expect, this the New York State call for reports is is broader. Um, I think it allows I would say it allows for a um, a wider spectrum of disease severity so that it would pick up children that weren't uh, as sick as those that would eventually meet the CDC case definition. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's something you need to look at side by side, but it has a lot of things in common. Um, they both require hospitalization. They both require, um, they're both focused on um, children under the age of 21. Um, and many, many of the same symptoms, but New York State is sort of casting a broader net um, in, in calling for reports, and then um, a smaller percentage meet the CDC case definition, but many of them do. Um, and I think we can look at those that don't, and we will be looking at those who don't um, in detail to understand if they represent a milder form of this illness or something else altogether. Uh, we have a follow-up question about um, uh, if you could discuss the differences. Everybody's reporting <clears throat> the racial breakdown of cases, and there do appear to be differences between different races. Can you um, can you speak about that? Is this question for me, Julie? Yes. Yeah. Sorry. Yes, uh, Dr. Schellinger, It's uh, it's about in Miss C cases. Right. So I think, you know, the case numbers are still relatively small, thank goodness. Um, so, um, but we see in the case numbers in terms of race ethnicity, uh, some of the same uh, disproportionate impact on uh, black, African American and Hispanic children um, that we do for just COVID uh, generally in the population. Um, so you could see, I don't have a slide up, but, but uh, I, I know when it was shown, of course, that 
that um, the number and percentage of children of color is larger than the number and than the percentage of those children in the New York City population. So they do appear to be disproportionately affected. Um, and the reasons for that are not clear. Um, some of it may have to do with uh, the fact that the neighborhoods where those children live are more affected. It may be um, it may be that, which is one kind of inequity, or there could be other explanations. But um, I think as we get more cases and have a chance to look at and sort of adjust for things um, between these groups, some things may become uh, more salient. Thank you, Dr. Schillinger. Um, and then I think we'll go back to Dr. Kaplan uh, for the next question, which is, um, now we have a specific question here, but can you talk a little bit about um, partners uh, resuming sexual relations after one of them has been isolating uh, for COVID-19? After, say that one more time, after one of, oh, after isolating, did you say? I couldn't hear the last part of the question. Yeah, sorry about that. I just turned my air conditioner on. Um, <laughs> if, uh, so if, if one of the partners, if the partners are isolating from each other because one has COVID-19, uh, when can they resume sexual activity? That is a really good question. Um, can, is, if there's another, I want to get back to you in a moment. Um, I want to make sure I have that. Correct, and I think I may need to reply post the webinar if I don't have time. I'm looking at the time, unless someone else on the call has that answer immediately at hand. Uh, I want to make sure I give accurate information. Um, well, we have another question, which is just if you could uh, describe, um, can you describe the infection control mother, uh, measures that we have for COVID positive mothers? Do you mean in the hospital? Yes. And I would refer to to guidance. Um, so we are, I, I'm not providing direct hospital care. Uh, and I, so I want to say that I know that that most hospitals now first of all, are testing people who are admitted to labor and delivery and uh, making and then using universal precautions in how they treat uh, people in, and if someone is known to be positive, um, making every effort to separate them. But I do not, I'm not able to give further details. I think there are different practices happening at different hospitals and um, I'm not uh, able to answer that specifically at, at this moment, though it's something we could get back to people on. Um, okay, that's great. I think we have two minutes. So, um, I think I'm both of those. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's all right. Um, and I guess we'll there. Uh, there was a question that we had that might be a little too tough to answer in two minutes uh, for Dr. Foot, uh, which is talking about um, you know we discussed that uh, there might be prolonged viral shedding in asymptomatic patients with COVID-19. Uh, are there any other examples of that or do we have any, um, or if not, can you talk about just the reasoning behind why we think that was true? Well, I, I think first it's really important to note that there is a big difference between detectable genetic material uh, and viable viral shedding. So as of now, um, from our understanding of the literature and our understanding of the virus, we have seen that PCR positivity um, can remain positive for well over a month in people that uh, no longer exhibit symptoms. However, that only means that we can detect genetic material from COVID-19. It does not tell us whether or not it's dead virus or whether it is actually able to infect somebody. The limited data that we do have looking at viral cultures in these scenarios show that even with prolonged detectable PCRs, the viral culture positivity drops off precipitously around nine days. And so that you know, is is the basis 
for the decision on extending the isolation, uh, isola symptom-based isolation guidance to 10 days post onset of symptoms. And that there's a really nice um, memo on the CDC websites outlining the literature and the data that we have so far to justify that recommendation. So I encourage you to take a look. Um, one interesting uh, report that just came out from the South Korean CDC, which is where we've been hearing um, kind of the most uh, in the news reports about people, um, whether it's, you know, questions around reactivation versus reinfection, where people that had been positive, um, positive PCR and then became their symptoms resolved, they were negative, tested for PCR, and then they subsequently tested positive again um, several weeks uh, later. And they just did a, they just announced a study where they were following these people and all of their contacts. And it does not show any transmission uh, of their contacts post uh, being released from their isolation period, their initial isolation period. There was no subsequent uh, transmission to any of the close household contacts, and that was over 700 close household contacts that they looked at. So that really um, is indicating that these patients are not continuing to be necessarily infectious, despite the fact that they may be shedding viral material. And I think actually we are at time, so we really appreciate all of our presenters. Um, I think it was an amazing, amazing variety of, of information that was shared today um, and really, really relevant and interesting. So um, also thank you to all our providers in New York City for joining us today and for all the amazing work that you do. We are so glad to be on this uh, journey with you and we look forward to speaking again soon. Thank you.